Today we hear the Lucan Beatitudes. Now this is a little different from the Beatitudes that we hear in the Gospel of Matthew. For one thing, um, Luke has it all happening on the Sermon on a Plain, where Matthew has it a Sermon on the Mount. He goes up the mountain. Some people have tried to say, well, you know, from one perspective it's a plain, but from another perspective it's at the top of a mountain, so it all makes sense. But, you know, Jesus was preaching for three years, going around. There's no reason to think that this all had to be one sermon. He could have been developing it over the time and different people at different times. But so when we look at the, the Beatitudes that we hear today, we have four Beatitudes as opposed to the eight that you get in uh, Matthew. And then instead of just being eight Beatitudes, you have four Beatitudes and then four woes. Whoa. So this, this is a little different, to say the least. And for instance, the very first one, Blessed are you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. Luke is much more short and uh, literal. Blessed are you who are poor. Matthew has it, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit meaning those who must then Trust in the Lord for everything, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are you who are now hungry, versus blessed are you who hunger and thirst for holiness, for righteousness. So there's some differences that go on. And yet, they're saying, he's saying pretty much the same thing. Luke and Matthew are taking different perspectives, maybe from two different sermons, but they're still speaking the same thing. And that is, we're called to trust in God, not in the world. Now, Luke makes it very clear that Jesus was saying, this is what happens when you trust in the world. Woe to you. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are now filled, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will weep and grieve. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for their ancestors treated the false prophets in this way, saying, this is the way of seeing things from God's perspective is very different from the way of seeing things in the world. The world says, blessed are you who are rich. Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor. Why? Because poverty is good? No. But the poor are much more inclined to have to rely on Almighty God. To have to rely on Almighty God. And it's very easy when we're in an affluent culture not to rely on God. To rely only on ourselves. It's very easy to do that. I'm thinking about... Um, I'd remembered this story that Father Mike Schmitz of Bible in a Year fame ha had told. And so I said, I need to go find this story. I need to go find this story because I, I want to get this right. So I went and I, I listened to a whole bunch of different uh, YouTube videos by Father Mike until I finally found it. And um, this is the story. He was talking about this man from China um, and I forget exactly what district he was in, but of course China is a very, in, in its communist nature, is a very anti-Christian, anti-God uh, society. And so this man, uh, as a Catholic, often would have clandestine masses in his house. And friends and trusted relatives would come and they would be there with the priest and be able to celebrate mass. But they kept a lookout for if the police would come in order to arrest them. Well, one time as they were celebrating Mass, the alarm went up, the police are coming, and so everyone scattered in all directions except this man. Because this man, well, it was his house. Where could he go? And so they came in and they arrested him and brought him to wherever it was that they bring him. And they they started interrogating him, where is the priest? Where is the priest? 
And then they started torturing him with uh, basically cattle prods, electric probes, burning different parts of his body. Where is the priest? And of course the man thought about, should he give the priest in? But he said, if I give them the location of the priests, then his family, his friends would no longer be able to have mass, no longer be able to have the Eucharist. And he loved the Eucharist too much to do that. He loved the Eucharist too much to do that. And so he continued to hold out. Well, after several weeks of this, the communist authorities realized they're not going to be able to break this guy, so they, they let him go. Well, shortly thereafter, uh, as soon as he could, he found his way over to the United States, and he was rejoicing so much. He rejoiced so much that he could go to Mass, and it wasn't illegal, that he could go to Mass openly. He went to weekend Mass, he went to daily Mass, and he rejoiced so much. But then he found out one of the other blessings of the United States, and that is, if you work hard, you can make more money. And so he wanted to be able to give more money to his family. And so he worked harder in order so that he could give that money to his family. And so he started missing daily mass. Because he wanted to make sure he had this money to give to his family. And then over time he started missing weekend masses. Then he was only going on Christmas and Easter. And Father Mike tells this, he says, when I heard this story, he said he didn't even get to Mass that Easter. What the tortures of the communist regime could not torture out of him, could not beat out of him, our affluent culture took away from him without even trying. His love for the Eucharist. Blessed are you who are poor. Because you have to trust in God for the next day. Woe to you who are rich. Not that, again, there's anything wrong with wealth or money or anything like that. But if that becomes our focus, that can easily rise up instead of our God being our focus, our God being the one in whom we trust. We're in a battle, right? We're in a battle for our souls, a spiritual battle. And if we don't realize that we're at war, guess what? We're losing. We need to recognize that we are at a bat, in a battle, a spiritual battle for our souls in order for us to say, okay, I'm going to put this part of me, which is good, down so that I can have something even better. Something even better. You, some of you, I noticed, were looking at some of these things that are in the pews, uh, at the ends of the pews, and I'll talk more about them at the end of Mass, but uh, it's an opportunity for us as we're moving closer to Lent. Oh no, Lent's coming. Ah! Just in a few weeks. Did you think about it? Usually, this time of year, what happens? We start thinking, what am I going to do for Lent? Usually the words are, what am I going to give up for Lent? Right? But it's not just about giving up. On the top of that prayer there at the ends of the pews is, Pray, give, fast. You know, it's three things. Prayer, almsgiving, and fasting are the three things that we focus on during Lent, that the church says these are the things we need to be doing. And so um, uh, some of the people in our parish, we said, we need to, it's easier to do something together than alone, right? I remember when I was in seminary, my first year in the seminary, one of the other guys in the seminary and I had decided that we were going to go swimming every morning in the seminary pool. We were going to do laps. We were going to get into better shape. We were going to make sure that we were taking care of ourselves, all these things. Well, you know what? Uh, there were days that I didn't want to get out of bed. I'm sure that's a surprise to anyone. You know, there are days that I didn't want to get out of bed. But Phil was waiting for me. 
And I always thought it was not a good thing to be swimming alone because, you know, you hit your head, you drown, you know, something like that. It's not, not a good thing. So I said, Phil is waiting for me. So I will make sure that I uh, uh, grab myself out of bed. When, when we do things together, when we hold ourselves accountable, when we're, we're held to account by other people, we have more push to do it. We have more drive to do it. And so some of the people in our parish were saying, wouldn't it be great if we had this challenge for prayer, fasting, and almsgiving for, for Lent so that we could actually, you know, maybe hold to more than like a week of our Lenten observances, right? Because we don't always do so good. And so we're talking about different challenges, and I'll talk about that at the end um, more, but these are an opportunity for us to grow in this. You know, blessed are you who are poor, that, that if we are to give alms, it means that we give of ourselves and we aren't rooted just in our own stuff, money and uh, things and whatnot, but we have to give even of those resources to help those who have less. I think about Cardinal George. I've shared this before, but Cardinal George, God rest his soul, in a gathering of donors at the seminary, said to them, the poor need you to pull them out of poverty, and you need the poor to keep you out of hell. That we need to give in order that our hearts become generous like God, blessed are you who are poor. Woe to you who are rich that we need to be not clinging, not attached to our money, to our stuff. Blessed are you who are now hungry, for you, you will be satisfied. Woe to you who are filled now, for you will be hungry. Bishop Sheen put it this way. The way of the world is first the feast and then the headache. But the way of the Christian is first the fast and then the feast. First Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. And so we have this fasting challenge in order to help us to focus more on, you know, maybe even allowing ourselves to be hungry. Blessed are you who are now hungry, for you will be satisfied. And then prayer roots ourselves not in our own time, not in our own understanding of ourselves or the understanding of the world, but in God. And so when people hate us and in, in, ex, exclude us and insult us on account of the Son of Man, because we say, well, you know what? This time of prayer, this time with God, this time at Mass is more important than what other people think of me. Just some things to think about, and we'll give you an opportunity if you'd like to sign up for the challenge, you're, you can do that. But to start thinking, how can I break my mind free from the thinking of the world so that I can think from God's perspective. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are they who are hungry. Blessed are they when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you, falsely because of me. May we allow God to form our hearts, our minds, our very beings, and be transformed closer into the heart of Christ.